recently found myself bored and wanted to read an ebook, but I didn't have my e-reader with me, and so I wanted to read it on my laptop. But I mean, who really wants to read a ebook on your laptop in just a boring old Windows application when you could be reading it in a nostalgia-inducing Incursus application? So I started googling around looking for command line tools for reading EPUB and didn't really find anything that I liked. So I thought, bored anyways, why not make one? So that's what I did. Um, I hacked it together pretty quick actually and because it was such a fun, simple, quick project, I thought going through the process from scratch might make a good uh, tutorial video sort of introducing people to just the way software engineers think and how we go about solving problems. So that's what I'm about to do here. I'm gonna pick that up from scratch. So being a fan of JavaScript, I decided to do this project in Node.js. Uh, the first thing you probably wanna do when you start any project like this is do a little bit of Google searching on prior art and any kind of libraries that'll help you. Um, what I found, you know, there were some existing command line e-readers, uh, most of which just didn't really quite do it for me. There was also um, quite a few existing libraries on helping you with this sort of thing. A good place to search for that if you're doing Node.js is in npmjs.com here. Um, this lets you search the repositories of sort of available packages you can easily pull down a node. Um, but again, I was bored, so I decided to go a little lower level than this, and what I ended up finding was this nice little blog here by Aaron Kavana that talks about the EPUB file format, and I learned that it's basically just a zip file. Um, so what I decided to do was just to start seeing if I had that file unzipped, uh, what would need to be done to render out those contents. So for a Node.js project, the first thing we want to do here is make a new directory for it. So we'll call this EPUB tutorial. And we'll just do a quick npm init. I won't spend too much time on this because there's plenty of other tutorials that show you how to do this. I'm just going to accept all the defaults and what that's going to do for us is to create a package JSON file with these contents in it basically. Um, and yes, so we now have this package JSON file there. Um, Next thing I'm going to do is notice that it says here our main file is index. That's our default. We're going to go ahead and create that file. And then because I'm a lazy coder, I'm going to go ahead and use an IDE to help me with this project. So I'm going to go ahead and open this directory. Now I'm using WebStorm here. There's a million IDEs that you can used to help make development easier. You can also just work in Vim. That works pretty good as well. So one of the first things we're gonna want to do here is take a look at some ebooks and just see if that structure holds true and see what we can find out. So I've got a few sample ebooks here and knowing that it's a zip file I'm just gonna copy them and rename them to zip and take a look inside. So just to keep Trump happy, we're going to start here with Fire and Fury. We're going to poke around in this. Um, now one important thing to know is in order to poke around in an EPUB like this, it will need to be a non-DRM'd version of this EPUB. Um, a lot of EPUBs which you'll get from um, stores like Barnes & Noble will have um, DRM usually in the form of some kind of encryption. So it's still really a zip file, but it's just all the stuff inside it's encrypted and you need a key to unlock that. Um, but there are also a lot of good sources of non-DRM EPUBs out there. Um, I got some of these from Humble 
bundle packs and um, some of the others. Well, we won't go into how I got those in non-DRM uh, versions. Um, that is a different subject. So basically you see here we have this structure which looks pretty much like we expect from the blog. We have this MIME type file here uh, that just sort of telling us what we already know. This is kind of like the content type, application, EPUB, plus zip. Um, the interesting stuff starts here in this meta inf. We have this container XML file, uh, which was it, if, if we open, we notice in here um, contains an entry for root file, which points at another file here. So see this OEBPS folder? Well, let's look here at our zip file and lo and behold we have an OEBPS. So if we look in here uh, we can find that file that it's pointing to and this has a .opf extension. This is actually though also just more XML, lovely lovely XML um, and let's see, so this here, you'll notice has what appears to be chapter information in it. So you notice here we have this properties nav here, we have this, this manifest section, under we have all these things here, it looks like chapter one, chapter two, they point to, um, they have href references to various other files labeled XHTML. And lo and behold, if we continue poking around in here, we're going to find those files. So looks like we ought to be able to extract our chapter information from there. And in fact, actually, um, from digging around a little farther, what you'll eventually find, um, one interesting thing you'll notice as we go along here is that every EPUB structures this a little different. Um, so it's kind of happy hacking trying to figure out the different places that different stuff is put. But this OPF file will tell you how to find the TOC file, sometimes called TOC, and that is really where you want to try and extract your chapter information. In the case of this particular book, it seems to have duplicated some of that, but what we're looking for here are these nav points. So, armed with that knowledge, we can start to build out our Incurses app. So at this stage, I was itchy to get something on the screen, so I decided to go to uh, Blessed here Blessed is a tool I've used in the past and already know about. Uh, it is a, as defined here, a curses-like library with high-level terminal interface API for Node.js. Basically, it lets you build in curses apps, um, as you're kind of seeing demoed here, which uh, looked like something you probably would have interacted with, uh, I don't know, in the early 90s. And that's basically what I want here. So you notice here, like if you look around for Incursus libraries, there are others, um, but you can see here, download stats, it's, it's pretty well used, battle tested library, one I'm familiar with. So that's the one I decided to use. So the first thing we need to do here is add that to our project. So we're gonna do npm install dash save, blessed. And that's going to download that. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to install some other things that we will eventually need here. Um, eventually, we're going to want to be able to unzip our uh, packages here. So we're going to need some sort of unzipping utility. And this is one that I found that seems to work pretty well with a JavaScript implementation here. So we're going to npm install dash save unzip. And we're also going to need something to parse XML. So I've got this guy here that I found, which works pretty well. And now 
what we're going to want to do here is we're going to just go ahead and try and get something on the screen here. So we're going to import our blessed library. And what, if you look over here, they've got a lot of lovely documentation. So you can see here, you include it like this, and then we're just going to instantiate a copy of the screen here. And I've already got a little bit of this typed out to sort of get this moving along quicker here. So what we're doing here is we're getting a hold of an instance of screen, and then what we're going to want, at least what I want for this EPUB reader, is just a simple layout where we've got, say, chapters on the left of the screen and contents on the right. So what I'm going to do here is use something called Blessed Box to just draw a simple box that we can put contents in. And I've got the box centered. I've got it pushed over to the left by 20%. Um, with a width of 80% and a height of 100% and we're going to create another box or in this case a list for our chapters which is basically if you look in the blessed documentation this derives from box and just lets us pass in a list of items and we need to append all these things to the screen. So we do screen.append. Let's go ahead and do chapters, screen.append. Content. And then we need to tell it to render. So let's see what happens if we try and run this. All right, now generally you get an error the first time you do that. Um, copy and paste and having kind of gone through this before makes this a little simpler. But you can see here we've got it, it rendered out. So we've got our box on the left, our box on the right, and that's what we want. Um, well, I did make one mistake here for the tutorial. So at least um, forgot to put in a way to exit this program. You'll notice here in most of the blessed samples, uh, they do, let's see, they add this. And this, uh, this lets you exit because blessed will take over the console and, um, you know, is overriding all the key inputs. So we'll fix that and then we will move on here. So let's go ahead and add that. So that's an important one. And you know what? I'm just going to create a new screen here. And another useful thing here, I started that with Node, but you can also use Node Mon here, um, which is a, a tool I've installed through NPM. You install that globally like this. And what that does is lets you launch a node process, but in such a way that it's monitored. And then if I change anything in that file, it automatically reloads. Um, that's useful when you're developing applications like this. Um, but now, well, there we go. Control C worked. Interestingly, Q does not seem to be working on there. Ah, so maybe in this case we don't want to use NodeMon because that seems to um, have some side effects. So in this instance, because we're developing an InCurses app, that causes some problems with uh, focus and uh, the keyboard. So stick with good old Node and we'll just have to reload manually between changes. So before I get into even parsing the zip file and, and whether or not we want to read it from mem into memory or extract it to a temp folder or how we want to deal with any of that, 
I thought easiest place to start would be to sort of poke around at just the individual files in here and see how much work it would take to parse them. And I'm going to start with the chapter file because really that's, to me, that's sort of the hello world of this is to be able to just get our list of chapters out of it. So I went ahead and I'm just going to extract the chapter file here into our demo books folder. And we're just going to go over here and try to read it and see what we can learn from that. So we're going to want to do is include fs, which is the node library for dealing with the file system. And we don't need to install anything for that because that is baked into node. We just need to require it into our file. And might as well tack this to the end. We're going to clean all this up later. This is just sort of our first experimental. Not exactly sure why my uh, ID isn't recognizing that, but what I'll do here is I've got that stored. here in demo books. I'm just gonna keep everything nice and simple, copy this URL out of the terminal. And that file was called toc.ncx. So first let's just see if we can read this file. And I'm using ES6 style functions here. You see there with the arrow brackets. And for now, let's just put this somewhere where we can see it in our incurses interface. So I'm just going to set it into our content box. Um, and let's go ahead and recognize if we have an error. My ID is not happy right now. I think that is probably because I don't have ES6 uh, Node.js um, turned on here. I will fix that in a minute. Let's just see. Okay, well, let's see if that works despite the IDE being unhappy with us. No. <laughs> well, so welcome to Programming 101. Uh, you will make typos. So right now, I cannot find module. Oh. Hmm. I appear to be in the wrong folder. So that makes sense. That module does not exist there. And now, okay, so EPUB tutorial index JS. This wouldn't really be a good uh, intro to software development if we didn't debug some mistakes. So let's see what's going on here. So apparently it does not recognize that for one reason or another. So let's make sure. So content is in fact what we called this. And let's go over to the blessed options here and make sure. So it, the set content method should exist. So it is possible that we're setting it to something it does not like, like this might possibly not be a string. So let's try this. 
We're just gonna sanity check ourselves. We're going to find out what this guy is, assuming this set content function exists and is kosher. Um, going to do foo plus type of data and see if that gives us anything. Well, it did not crash. There we go. Foo is an object. That is what I suspected. So data here is probably a stream rather than a string. So we're just going to try calling to string on it and see if that fixes our problems. Hmm. No crash, but uh, nothing rendered, so that's interesting. Well, very interesting. What we're going to do here, sometimes it's easier to debug these without the uh, blessed getting in our way. So if we get rid of, really all we need to get rid of is this screen.render. And then we should be able to see our console log. So let's just debug this real quick. Make sure we get see what that gives us. Okay, so that looks better. Um, not quite sure why Blessed was having problems with that, but we now get output as we'd expect. So that shows us we're reading in the contents of this XML file. Now the next trick is we want to see if we can't parse out something useful from that. Um, going to fix my syntax highlighting in my IDE here real quick and be back shortly to show you that. Okay, that looks quite a bit better there. Um, so now that I've enabled node support and ES6 support in my IDE here, um, We'll continue, and I think also I've figured out what our problem was here with ink curses. Um, so we're going to go ahead and switch this back. Let's go ahead and take out that return. What I was doing there was just returning from the function in the event that there was an error. At just kind of saves me from having some extra nesting with the else. It's kind of what would happen with that return there is that on this line we would set the contents and return from the function so nothing after that would be executed. Um, instead I'm just going to use an else block here because what I want to do is have something else that executes in both of these cases, both the if and the else. Let's go ahead and set our, oops, set our content here in the event that we succeed. And then here is what we were missing before. With blessed, anytime you make a change, you need to tell the screen to update. And we weren't doing that, so of course it was not working. There we go. Now we've got the contents of our XML file over here. Obviously that's not what we want, but that shows us that two things are working. We're able to update the contents of this box and we're able to extract our XML file here. So next thing we're gonna wanna do is instead of just dumping that out, 
what we're going to want to do is we're going to use our parse library up here that we um, saved earlier. So we're going to go ahead and require that. And we're going to parse this object out. So we call this XML object. And we're going to do parse data. And assuming data is valid XML, this should give us a JavaScript object that we can deal with to actually start querying and finding out more about that XML. And because we don't know much about what that's going to look like yet, we're just going to go ahead and inspect this object and get a sense of what this library is giving us. Um, you can also read the documentation, which I highly recommend, but sometimes it's also useful just to poke around. I'm going to go ahead and require utils here. I believe that's utils plural. Need an E there. And we're going to inspect XML object and let's just see. Seems to not like that. There we go. <laughs> Parse is not a function. So apparently we did not include that library properly. Hmm? Parse equals parse. Well. Could be, we need to do that. This does not work. I'll go ahead and look at our finished project and just see what I did there. Okay, well, let's cheat. Hmm. Possibly I used a different library. Um, okay. So it looks like what I ended up doing was XML parser. So let's do that. <laughs> Fun times. Um, Okay, trying to go back through this from memory, but this is good. This gives us some debugging. I think probably this library is set up to actually sort of consume the file itself, if I remember correctly. Um, so let's see. Let's look over here at what we did. Hmm. Parse. So it does take an XML string and parse it. Um. Interesting. So this should be our. St oh, you know what? Same mistake twice. Got to be careful with that file read there. We're going to get back a, a stream, which is useful in a lot of cases because that means if you don't want to deal with the data directly in this function callback as a string, you can pipe it to other functions or pipe it potentially straight back to the client if all you're doing is returning it straight. And that saves you on some serialization, deserialization, and can be good for performance. So that's why 
it does that, but it's important to remember that it does that. So when you call this fs read file, it's going to return not a string, but a a uh, string buffer or a stream. And if you want to look at that as a string, you need to first to string it. And this is default, I believe. But let's go ahead and specify utf8 there. Um, I think that's just good practice. There we go. Now we got something ugly, but more useful here. So we see um, sort of the upper level here of how this um, library parsed out our XML. Um, inspect is nice because it does not dig recursively into the JavaScript object, which can cause a stack overflow. So if we wanted to dig deeper, like for example, see what is in children here, to get more information about that, we'd have to run this again. So we now know that XML object has a root, and that root has a name, and it has attributes. And within those attributes, no, actually within the root is something called children. So if we were to dig slightly deeper here, Let's verify that we have a root. Yep, in fact, now we get a little more information about these children. We're a little bit deeper. And really from here, that's all we need to know out of this. From there, we should be able to look at, now that we kind of know how that breaks it down, we should be able to just sort of look at our XML here and see what we want to get out of this. And it, looks like what we're going to want to do is start out with with our root but from there we need to be able to find this nav map and we need to be able to look through the nav map for these nav labels which are nested under nav points so we have all these objects of type nav point. Underneath those, we have nav labels. And we have content. So let's go ahead and cheat again and look over here at my finished one. We're going to make this a little simpler, but we'll use this for reference. So have over here a get chapters. And and ignore that for now. Yeah, this is a little more complicated than we want to start out with here, I think. So let's just look at, so we have our root. And then we're going to take this little guy out and look at that. So what we're going to do here is take our XML object. We're going to inspect that root object that we found and we're going to look at its children and we're going to find within that children um, anything called map nav map and then let's just go ahead and inspect that and let's go ahead and make this a little prettier console logs really don't work too well within the context of a blessed app. So there we go. So now we see we, we've got the right object, but from there we see that it also has children and its children have what we're interested in, which are these nav points. Um, so what we really want to do is 
map these guys to something more useful. Um, might have to do a little more filtering, but let's just let's look at this real quick. So we want to look at navmap.children. And we want to iterate over that. And it looks like what we're interested in. Let's see here. So navmaps children are going to be nav points. And it looks like it is going to in turn have children, which conform to this nav label type here. So what we want to do is look at the children of nav map. Sorry, the children of nav map. And we want to find within that we want to find within each there's only one nav map though so that should simplify things so we want to find within that all of our nav points So let's just go ahead and filter on type nav point. That seems like a good place to start here. So that we know we have only nav points. Node.name equals nav point. And sure enough, we've now got our series of nav points. Those in turn have the children we want to go after. Um, you can see here why like XML is often considered overstructured for a lot of um, things these days. It definitely has its uses and JSON which is currently more in vogue can sometimes be just as nasty I think. But I think the, the problem with XML is it lends to these really sometimes overly structured documents that can be a pain to parse out. And I mean, this is even having had this XML parser library do a lot of the work for us and already parsing it into a JavaScript object. But basically, I think what we want to do from here is go ahead and map. So we're going to pass over all of our nav points, and then we're going to just go ahead and simplify this and assume that they each have two children. And so we've got our nav point here that we're inspecting. And what we're going to go ahead and return, let's just go ahead and return a string for this case. So what I expect is that the nav point's first child is going to be this nav label. So let's find out if that is true. Um, actually, let's see here. Dot children dot find Let's just go ahead and assume there's one nav label search for that and then what we're going to want from that nav label is this text attribute here. Um, let's see, these get represented as attributes, so that might be yet another child. Let's see how badly this blows up and what we get out of that. Okay. <laughs> Let's go one level out. Okay, we've now got attributes. We're looking at attributes. We're looking at a nav label. It does have children. Oh. You might know what I did there. 
I did this. We actually want it's dot children. And here we go. This is looking more like what we want here. And you can see we have this content attribute that the the XML parser has created for us. Um, so we're close to having a string with all the chapter names here. So great, that's looking a lot better. We now have an array of chapter titles. So what we could do here if we wanted is we could go over here to our chapters object and we're going to set items to chapters. Maybe. Okay, um, that's funny. I see what I've done here. So this is a little bit of namespace collision within the scope of this function. I've defined chapters, but um, what I'm refer trying to refer to here is my chapters UX element. Um, part of that is just the nature of how we're hacking this together in a single file and not really doing this in the modular way that would be proper. So that lends these sort of mistakes. So we're going to just call this chapter list. Now chapters should be accessible outside of this scope. And we're going to pass that in. And we're going to hope for better results. Bang. All right, here we go. So we now have our chapter list over here. Um, you'll notice I just filtered that down to strings. Um, to really get this working, we're going to want to filter this down to some sort of more useful object because when we select one of those, what we're going to want to be able to do is pull out of that index this uh, second uh, child here, which is our URL, which points to where we need to go. Um, and before we do that, though, I want to show one more thing here, and then probably what we'll do is just take a look at the finished source for this project. Um, but I want to talk first off about getting the actual contents of a particular chapter out. Um, because you'll notice if you look in this zip what these chapters look like. We have these XHTML files. And they're essentially web pages. Um, some EPUBs you'll find conform more to like a standard HTML format, but in general, they basically follow this XHTML convention, which is just HTML except by specifying the X, you're sort of trying to say, I'll make this easier on the parsers, I guarantee that I'll have closing tags, and it'll be HTML that also conforms to XML. I know that used to be really popular, uh, Microsoft was big on that, and then I think it sort of fell out of vogue with HTML5, and I've heard it's maybe coming back in vogue. But that's what we have here. So how do we want to render this to text that we can show on the console? Well, I got to thinking about this, and because I was trying to do this as a hack, kind of as quick as I could, I thought, why not take the uh, Unix philosophy and reuse something that I've already got? So I googled around for um, command line web browsers. And the one I found, which I had encountered before, is W3M. So we can take W3M here, and we can point it at our file here. Let's point it at chapter22.xhtml, and bang, it gives us a nice rendering on the console of that file. So what I decided to do was to just um, cheat and rather trying to parse all that out just to let that program do the work for me. And I'm going to kind of show that here and this is going to be nice and ugly and then we'll look at a cleaner version here. I'm going to go ahead and install for convenience so that it's not quite as ugly a library called async. 
um, promises and async await are sort of getting rid of the need for this a little bit, but this is a little utility that I like to require in node projects that lets you just clean up asynchronous code. What I could do is start writing another asynchronous call inside of here, but then you get these highly nested structures that are very hard to read. So what I like to do instead is use this async.waterfall method. And actually, since that's almost all I ever use from async, let's just go ahead and extract that as a single function. So waterfall takes an array of functions that we want to call as well as a final callback here. And it always supplies us with a callback for each of these to tell us when it's done. I like to call that next and prefix it with an underscore just to sort of indicate that it's just an internal structural element for this function. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this code We're going to re go ahead and keep that in place, read our chapters out. I'm going to get rid of this. Move that to the tail here. And this lets us consolidate our air handling in one place too, which is nice. Um, So what this will do is if we have some kind of error here and we pass error next, it's going to short circuit and fall straight to this callback at the end with the error. Otherwise, we're going to go through and do our code here and we're going to call next with no errors there. And now we're going to create a second function here. And one cool thing about waterfall is that if I wanted to thread some data along these functions, I could do this. And then down here, I could pick that up and this next function and choose to thread it along. Um, it's a useful way to just sort of waterfall um, things on down this line as you accumulate data from different asynchronous sources. Um, in this case, I'm not going to worry about that because we're not even going to try to open a specific chapter. We're just going to use this uh, test file. We are going to need to pull in another function here. In this case, we're going to pull this in from child process and we're going to pull in exec. And this is going to let us execute an external function here as though we we're on the shell. So we're going to go ahead and x exec w3m and we're going to basically do exactly what we did here. So let's just copy that out. And it should give us a callback. Should give us, I believe the function here is air std out and std air. That's standard out, standard air, and let's just take a chance on being right on that and see if we blow up. Um, but that's pretty easy enough to look up. Actually, might as well. So what I would do if I was gonna find this out is I would go to the no documents for exec child process. Um, it's good to get familiar with uh, these documentations here. So this is for node 9.5. I'm using um, 8.x, but it's probably not changed and you can easily change versions. But if we look for our exec command, We've got exec, path, arguments, and in fact, lo and behold, takes a callback. 
and we have air, std out, std air. So I was right. It's good to just verify that though. So now what we're going to do with this is if there's an error, we'll go ahead and break the execution chain and short circuit to the end here. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we are going to content.set content to this standard out, which was returned from this program. And we're going to just call next with no error. And that should bring us down to here where we should call screen.render. So let's see what happens. All right. That looks pretty promising. So over here, we have our content. Um, and I also notice I can already scroll through it and stuff. That was kind of courtesy of this little copy paste job I did. Um, Blessed has a lot of nice things for just kind of doing that um, manually. So that's scrollable true, mouse true. And I figured that out by reading the documentation that Blessed provides and just kind of hacking around and trying that out. Um, at this stage, I think you, you kind of get the idea. We've got basically enough thrown together in this file to see that this project's possible, kind of the general libraries and pieces we'd need. This is the point where I'd start kind of cleaning this up and trying to make this into a real project. And I'm not going to go through all of that. Um, but what I will do is just sort of show you the final uh, result here, um, which is a working CLI e-reader that I did end up creating. And I'm going to go ahead and make sure I've got the latest version of that and then walk you through that code real quick. Okay, so my final project here is something I've called Clyworm and I've made available on NPM and if you look at it here, it is basically the same thing that we we're doing over there, except I've cleaned it up quite a bit. Um, so I replaced the uh, async library here with promises, which are now available uh, via ES6 in the latest versions of Node, um, I believe starting with 6.x. Um, and I've also taken a lot of the code out of this index.js and I've abstracted it out into um, different uh, files here to make it easier to find things. So most of this code here is in a utils uh, file and this is all the code for um, a lot of the stuff we were doing before for dealing with um, parsing the uh, various XML files. Um, so I've gotten here basically um, sort of the first thing we need to do is, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a temp directory. Um, so that is over here in this utils file somewhere. There we go. So that I'm just pulling in a library and this has sort of a platform agnostic way to get a temporary directory. And then what I do here is I unzip uh, the EPUB into that directory. Um, probably in a future version, I'll see if I can't just um, parse the zip file out into memory and deal with it that way. But this makes things simple for dealing with the URLs and so forth that the um, various chapter files uh, give you. So we're basically, we're using this unzip library, which we installed earlier in the tutorial, and we're creating a read stream. And remember how I said that uh, like read file likes to return a string buffer. In this case, we're just gonna use this create read stream and we're going to get a stream back and pipe it straight into this unzip parse. And this library is going to let us listen for certain events. Um, they do have an extract method in this unzip library, which is a lot simpler and just simply extracts the file into a directory of choice. But what I ran into was that there were some issues in this library with certain EPUB files. Um, might be something worth digging 
deeper into and seeing if I can't upstream a fix to their library. But um, basically what would happen was some of these files had entries for what should be folders, but they were labeled with the type of file. Um, now, interestingly enough, all these entries, the name for this supposed file would end in a slash, but nevertheless, they called it file. And so what happened when you tried to extract one of these was the library would crash because it would create this folder as a file, and then it would go to create other files inside of that folder, and it would try to make the directory find that there was a file already there and crash. So rather than letting it do the extract fully on its own, I just used its parse functionality. And each time it parses a particular file, it emits it here, and I can decide if I want to save it out or not. Um, if you don't want to save out a file, you just call this entry.autodrain, which just um, that's just going to let the buffer drain, and it's going to let this thing sort of know that this file is processed, and we just move on. So what I kind of do here is I look for that case where we have a file, but the last entry in that file's name is the path separator for our operating system. And in that case, instead, I just create that directory if it doesn't already exist and um, go ahead and drain. Um, otherwise, I do basically the, the normal thing. Um, I use this make derp to just ensure that um, the path we want exists and then I go ahead and I just pipe out those contents into a write stream into that new path. That ends up extracting the contents of our EPUB into a zip folder. Um, now all this looks familiar we have a get chapters function here once we've got that extracted we want to get the chapters right so we read that file and all this is just kind of piped down through these promises over here so we create a tempter you'll see this is worth looking at all of the, all of these functions pretty much what they do is they return a new promise and promises let you basically say when you've fulfilled that promise you can resolve or reject it and when you resolve a promise, you're going to fall into this then case here. If you reject it, you're going to fall into a catch. So, create our tempter. We unzip our file into our tempter. And we thread along this temp path, which is the base location where all this stuff's stored. We get our root file, which we just assume that all of these have a meta inf container XML. So far everyone I've looked at does. That file in turn tells you where that .opf file was that we looked at, which in turn is going to tell you where the, the chapter file is. The chapter file in this case, the one called toc.ncx. So we just go down each of these parts in these files and sort of getting the location of the next file. The chapter file is going to give us the titles of those chapters as well as URLs to those um, files. Um, important note though, it gives those URLs relative to its own location. So that's kind of relative to where we found the OPF file. So we need to sort of keep that in mind when we fill in those chapter locations. Um, and yeah, basically then at the end we'll, we'll update our UI. So like all the stuff around Blessed, I pulled out into this UI object. Um, so this is just a class that I can create that constructs our UI. Um, again, I'm using some ES6 stuff here, which makes dealing with uh, classes and, and inheritance in JavaScript much simpler. Um, in JavaScript, I tend to go light on the use of classes and inheritance um, probably th that may change now that there's better syntax for dealing with it but JavaScript's prototype inheritance system is it's really powerful and in a lot of ways I think it's more powerful than your sort of classical inheritance systems and especially in that you can implement that style of inheritance within it but you can also do a lot of other stuff but I tend to think at least 
classically in JavaScript, it gets really messy, and I tend to prefer using things like uh, mix-in patterns, which are things that in other languages I would say would be messy and I wouldn't tend to do. Um, or in a lot of languages, they're just simply not even possible. But in JavaScript, it, it's very nice for that. But here, we're basically, I'm just choosing for simplicity to create a class. That way we can instantiate it and sort of reference state. I'm not actually going to do any sort of inheritance with that class. That's also something I like to do in JavaScript. You, you create a class, but you don't really necessarily have to get into deep inheritance. You can just create classes for the convenience of holding some simple functionality. So that's what we're doing here. This is going, constructor is going to create our uh, screen um, and store a reference to that. It's going to create our chapters object, store a reference to that, create our content object, append all that, defines its own render function, which is really just calling screen.render for right now. But we could possibly encapsulate other functionality in that. Um, and it exposes some setters and getters for dealing with that internal state. Um, it also exposes some events we can listen to so that we know when new chapters are selected um, and different uh, functionality like that. Um, all this just makes things a lot cleaner, prevents you from making mistakes like I did earlier where I uh, over wrote the uh, chapters variable uh, within my local scope and it will save you a lot of headache. Um, so let's just basically, let's see how this all works. So I'm in my folder here and I'm going to execute my index.js file and I'm gonna point it at that Michael Wolf EPUB. And we've got our chapters and lo and behold, we can select our chapters and we can tab over to our contents and we can scroll through them using the arrow keys or also our, our mouse works as a scroll. You can also select these with the mouse. We can arrow through them. And this is pretty much, um, well, this is what I wanted. So now in theory, I should be actually just enjoying reading eBooks, but um, instead I'm making these tutorials. I'll go a little farther with this and show you something else I did here. So ideally what we want is we want to be able to execute this from a command line. So what I've done here in my package file is I've added this bin attribute and I've specified CLI worm and that goes to index.js. And what that means is that if I install this globally and we can, for testing purposes, we can install something simply from the current directory so I'm going to npm install dash g my current directory and now if I type CLI worm we should get the same thing um, and what that does there is that just tells node to create a, a symlink to this file in the bin directory um, when it's installed um, and I've also something you want to do is create readme so I've, I've got a nice readme here that explains how you can install this this is all up on my github um, that is over here at github.com slash chris weininger slash clyworm um, it's also available for install you can now install that like I did there npm install dash g Flyworm will work. Of course, um, one issue with this is you'll notice in the README we have prerequisites because right now we're depending on this W3M utility being installed. Um, there's a couple ways around that. I mean, I'm sure we could get some like actual modules that we could use that include on our project to do that lifting for us rather than depending on the presence of this external command. But another fun thing we can do here, because a lot of times it is useful to pipe different programs together. Um, it's a Unix philosophy, and hey, that's microservices. So I've created this snapcraft file here. Um, this is only going to work on 
Linux systems. So OS X for now, you'd have to brew install W3M, NPM install dash G, Clyworm, not too hard. But on any Linux system that supports snaps, I've used Snapcraft to build a snap. And what the snap does is packages all our dependencies into a single installable file that creates a sandboxed environment for us. So what I've said here, this is a little similar to our bin entry in our package file, I've said in the snap I want to expose a command called clyworm which is going to map to this command called clyworm. I've said in my parts that this is Node.js application and I've said to use the current directory as the source for that so that's basically this Node.js plugin that they've provided and the Snapcraft is going to know about this package JSON file and the structure here. It's going to look at that and it's going to do a node build, npm install, all that fun stuff. Also I have these stage packages which are basically using the repositories that are provided with um, Ubuntu circa 1604 I believe and it's basically basically within the context of the snap going to do the equivalent of apt install w3m for me. So what all that means is that regardless of whether you're on an Ubuntu system or a Red Hat system or Arch um, you can basically install this snap and behind the scenes it will install node, it will install w3m and it will install my file but all that will sort of be hidden and invisible so whatever version of node is packaged with this and w3m won't be exposed and interfere with your wider system all that will be exposed actually is just a command called clyworm everything else is packaged nicely inside of that uh, it's a pretty cool system I'm hoping to see adoption of that grow um, I don't have this snap properly published yet I just started uh, working on this the other day but um, that should be coming soon it should be another way to easily install this I've never really been known for my brevity so we're, we're gonna wrap this up um, hopefully this is useful to someone um, if not useful, then I don't know. Hopefully it's a long rambly ASMR video for someone or something. I don't know. The internet's full of weird, wild, and wonderful people. So hope you got something out of this. Please feel free to give me some feedback. And um, love to hear from you.